Good evening. Uh, my name is Christy Ballet, an assistant professor of architecture here. Tonight, it is my pleasure to co-host with assistant professor Justin Diles this masterfully casual stare discussion between our two Baumer visiting professors, Neil Denari, uh, professor of practice, and Robert E. Zomel, professor of theory. For those of you that do not know, the Baumer Seminar is designed to offer advanced students of architecture an in-depth view into the work of seminal architecture practitioners and theorists. We see this discussion tonight as a cross between the intimacy of a seminar discussion and a prime time Baumer lecture, a contemporary fireside chat. Since Justin has been in the thick of it with Neil all day, I'm going to lead the introduction, but we will both be providing questions as needed to keep the conversation going. Although I suspect, knowing these two, that this will not be a problem. Also, I might add that we have a shadow panelist in the audience. I will not name him now, but it should soon become clear. <laughs> there are many overlaps between, between these two, a special occasion to have this discussion here tonight. Of note is that they are both from the East Coast and ended up or stayed on the West Coast for significant parts of their careers. They had a significant overlap in teaching appointments at UCLA in the early 2000s when Sylvia Lavin was the director a time when technology and theory were in the ring together, duking it out. I was fortunate to be in that ring as I had both of them as a professor at the same time in 2003. Neil leading a studio, empty form, no program, and Bob telling us the nuances between form and shape in the other room. It was heated. And most importantly, they both have deep, deep arsenals of tricks related to their expertise. So for the, I will now offer just a brief introduction of each of them before we launch in this evening. Neil Denari is an architect, professor, and design wunderkind. He's a principal of NMDA, Neil M. Denari Architects, and professor of architecture at UCLA. He's also the author of the book that sat on the top of my pile for many years, akin to being bookmarked today, the book Gyroscopic Horizons, published in 1999, which illustrated to the world his meticulous sensibility. It was, it was referenced by many at the time who relied on it for conceptual development of ideas, modes of representation, and simply for setting and raising the bar for what was possible. He is working on a forthcoming book, Mass X, to be released in spring 2016, which I suspect we will talk quite a bit about this evening. Robert E. Zomo is an educator, writer, and theorist. Since 2007, he is the director of the School of Architecture at UIC, the University of Chicago, following a short stint, teaching stint here in 2005 to 2006. In addition to developing a school with a strong disciplinary agenda that is impacting discussions in many other universities, he is, he is primarily in the business of making movements. He does not see his role or the role of architecture to cater to audiences, but rather to actively produce these audiences in the world. He strives to be out of step, untimely, counterintuitive. He keeps his eye on the cultural project, and to do this, he avoids themes and focuses on the dis a discipline-only approach. As this discussion wraps our time with Neil here at school, and we were all fortunate to see his work a few weeks ago, I will offer a slightly longer introduction for Bob, who will be kicking off the theory portion of the seminar tomorrow and offering a public Baumer lecture in the spring of 2016. Bob's writings are within the vital mix of ingredients that provoke and assist in the continued development of the discipline. Reading a few article titles may help those of you that are not yet familiar understand that we are dealing with a critic that approaches the discipline from a fresh angle and offers not so subtle nudges to help us stay on task, reminds us it's okay when we don't, and offers 12-step plans for when we're ready to get back on track. Article titles, for example, 12 Reasons to Get Back in Shape, Dummy Text or the Diagrammatic Basis of architect Contemporary Architecture, Still Crazy After All These Years, and Accidents Will Happen. So, as we play out tonight, let me share two final notes. 
Bob is known for giving you this when you're expecting that. And Neil is precise, intentional, and brings far more of this than you expected. So, to riff from Bob. Okay, here's the plan. We'll ask you questions, and then we'll have a discussion. That's how, it's, that's how, that's how this uh, big stare discussion is gonna go. And so it begins. <laughs> All right. Um, um, I think uh, Jeff and I were talking uh, a bit about this uh, this morning, and I think one of the, um, for all the reasons that I've listed, uh, the, the overlap of these two is quite significant, and I think worthy of this discussion the evening, this evening. But I think one way, um, if, if Jeff lets me uh, kind of steal his question to kick this off, is to ask the question um, of Neil and Bob that one, when Neil, when you decided to um, to write uh, to write your book of the forthcoming uh, the forthcoming book of the work of your office, um, you asked one person uh, to write with within the book, um, and you asked Bob uh, to do this. I think it would be kind of an interesting way to kick off uh, to understand why you uh, selected Bob, or alternatively, it could be interesting. Uh, for Bob to jump in and explain to us why he thinks Neil um, asked him to write, uh, selected you uh, to write. Um, and if I can also tee up, tee up the other uh, question, it would be uh, for Bob, and that would be, if you had finished the article in, on time, what would you have written? Should I answer the first one, or you want to dive in? Um, Yes. Well, actually, I'm supposed to officially say that uh, we're all here because of Jeff, and don't ever uh, let him forget to remind you of that. <laughs> um, um, is that good? <laughs> um, so... Uh, Yesterday, more or less, Jeff texted me and said, do you mind talking about Neil's work for 20 or 30 minutes? And I said, well, I don't have anything, really. And he said, well, you were asked to do the essay. I mean, I wasn't, so you must have something. And I think, he said, why, did, why do you think Neil asked you? And the parentheses being, and not me. Uh, <laughs> and I think it was because Neil probably knew that I wouldn't finish it on time and he wouldn't need anybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I think that you know, I, I, uh, I can let Neil answer the question of why he did it, and, but I did because I felt nervous that I would have to be on the spot. I did take some notes uh, in the last hour about why I find an uh, attachment to Neil's work, so I can also do that at some point. But basically, I think, um, you know, I have not concentrated on the, let's say, all the scholarship that you guys have done, uh, in a sense. I haven't really done my homework on Neil the way that uh, your seminar uh, with Neil and Justin is done. So um, this is really, uh, I guess, you know, my selfish use of Neil, uh, which is to say, if you can't use your friends, who can you use? Um, and so, I, you know, for me, Neil's work was very helpful to me at certain points in time and actually was sort of the only practice for a while that I could see uh, manhandling into doing work that I needed to do given the kinds of enemies I was making. Um, let's put it that way. Um, and so most recently I guess, and, and Neil was the kind of respondent to a talk that I gave at UCLA where I sort of outlined these two trajectories or genealogies in contemporary work and I didn't actually share with Neil yet that he's in that but I just didn't present that part at UCLA. Um, so, uh, and you'll see this in February in the talk I give, so I won't want to, I don't want to lay this out too much, but just let me give you the bare bones of the thing so you can see more or less where it's going, which is that, you know, let's say there was a, there was a moment in time when there was a transparency or isomorphism or one-to-one -one connection between, let's say, form and ideology, right? Um, 
and even if it wasn't true, that was presumed to be true, but that at a certain point, that was no longer capable of being believed, and there was a break. And Colin Rowe represents one break, saying, you know, we can't have both, let's go with the form and dump the ideology. And then on the other hand, you had Rainer Bannum saying, uh, you're right, we can't have both, let's dump the form and go with the ideology instead. So this was sort of the two trajectories, right? Form, dump the ideology, ideology, dump the form. And in a way, in the early moments, let's say, of these relationships between critics and architects, in this case, Rowe's relationship to John Haydick stands in for one point. Bannum's to Cedric Price represents the other. So this is the beginning of this two-track system. Uh, for me, the, the upper track goes into Rossi and subsequently Eisenman. Uh, the lower track from Price and Bannum goes into the Venturis and Kulhas. And in a way, um, in Eisenman's case, it's not just form, but form against form. In Kulhas' case, it's not just ideology, but ideology against ideology, or lifestyle against uh, lifestyle. Um, and, I mean, in a way, there's anecdotal evidence to prove the connection, one of which is that, you know, as an aside, Michael Hayes' book, Desire and Architecture, does really well at documenting the top trajectory. It's exactly that trajectory, Haydick, Rossi, and Eisenman. And then he kind of loses the plot at the end and invokes Shumi. Uh, it doesn't really want to end with Shumi. It really wants to end more against Kulhas, but that's the kind of way in which he does that. Um, but the, the summary for that legacy for me is someone like Liebeskin, whose three machines in architecture restate Haydick, Rossi, and Eisenman as the, mem as the reading machine, the memory machine, and the writing machine. So in a way, Liebeskin is part of that top trajectory. In the lower trajectory from Price Bannum to Venturi's to Kulhas, the fourth character would be for me Toyo Ito. Um, and then to up, swing it up to now, I guess Scott Cohen is the end of that trajectory up there. And for me, Neil is the one who inherits the legacy of the Bannum, Price, Venturi, Kulhas, Ito lineage. And so in a way, Neil is my only friend. Um, <laughs> because most people are practicing in the top line the high architectural tradition uh, of, a, you know, of which Scott is the tortured exemplar of difficulty and complexity and neuroses. Um, and I, you know, so for me, Neil became the exemplar of a certain cool easiness that comes out of that uh, lower legacy. And so that was part of, let's say, the use uh, value, I guess, that I, I see in the, in the current genealogy. The other is that Neil's affiliations are not to art, but they're to design. In other words, I think of the, a lot of the other practices, the primary idea of architecture is a kind of art. I think Neil has taken the riskier trajectory, which is to say architecture's affiliations are to design, interior design, fashion design, industrial product, but even especially graphic design. Uh, in other words, it's, it risks being more of a background circumstance. And I think this, again, also shows against the critical legacy of architecture of which Michael Hayes would be one, but Hal Foster could be another, the, the animosity to design uh, and the elevation of art as a reflective critical practice. So for me, Neil's embrace, you could say, of trying to architecturalize design lessons is a very different trajectory than other architects. Um, the other, I guess, is uh, that Neil gave us not just color, as you demonstrated, but in particular, seafoam green. <laughs> that, to me, is enough of a, of a mark that uh, it's a specific reference, uh, which to me suggests, you know, sometimes it's chartreuse sometimes it's more teal or aqua, uh, but in any case, it's a fake green. Uh, it's not real green. In other words, it's about fake nature uh, and <laughs> artifice, um, but I think it also connects it to me, the reference, of course, uh, and Neil and I share many generational popular cultural references, is to Hawaii Five-O, uh, which many of you don't know except in the current version, which is terrible. Uh, but in the real version in the 70s, seafoam green was everything with seafoam green. It was just a world made out of seafoam green. Uh, and so there is a kind of cultural pop political project that Neil has, which I would say is not a science project. Uh, and so, in a way, Neil DeFight is a design but not an art project, and a politics cultural project, or pop culture project, but not a science project. In other words, it's not about biological analogies or life, 
Uh, it really is what Jeff would term, in my terms, lifestyle. And part of it is that 70s sensibility. It's pop music, it's film, it's television. Um, last, uh, another thing is that Neil, for me, single-handedly made clear the significance of the reflected ceiling plan as a technique <coughs> and as a drawing. Uh, and that basically, uh, let's say if modernism wanted to neutralize or make equivalent the floor and the ceiling by abstracting each plane, in a way, Neil's version is how to thicken, articulate, uh, specify both surfaces into a kind of equivalence. And so it's what he calls, I think, visual ergonomics. And somehow there's an optical part, but also a bodily haptic performative part together. And I think that so the, the rendering equivalent of those two surfaces, not through reduction, but actually through a kind of uh, excess. Um, um, and, you know, I think it also, let's say, this visual ergonomics idea really undoes what Ken Frampton would dichotomize as tactile haptic practices versus optical visual ones. Um, uh, let's see, whatever. So the, the first sentence of the, the only thing I, as far as I got in the essay for Neil was the first line, which is, image isn't everything, but it's a lot of things. Uh, and so really the issue was how Neil's work kind of re-engaged the issue of image in architecture. Um, and part of it is through this visual ergonomics thing, the collapse of tactility and opticality. Um, but I also I think that that's the part of the project that is most similar to, you could say, strange bedfellows or friends or alliances with the work of Herzog Demeron, uh, which is to say how there is a kind of consistent transubstantiation of matter into image in, in both projects. Uh, and in Neil's case also, making one feel one's inhabiting a plastic environment or a plastic politics, it's always open to transformation. So even in HL23, uh, you could say uh, the building is held up by the image or the graphics or the artifice. Um, uh, and also the way in which it operates, as we talked earlier about a kind of Photoshop in the real world that the, the reality of it is more imageable and uh, artificial, let's say, than even the rendering can be. Um, so I think that, you know, again, that goes again with Neil's constant, the way in which architecture could come out of a graphic space, but the collapse of matter or thickness and graphic image and, and thinness. So even, let's say, the question of uh, Poche in the no mass, ha no mass house um, or no moss house. Um, the traditional association of Posse with thickness and security, uh, privacy versus the thinness that one associates with the modern tradition of transparency and freedom. And so in, in that way, a kind of extension of maybe Ito's work on a hollow Posse or uh, Sana's work on a kind of invisible Posse. Um, uh, and I mean, I think the, the earliest incarnation of my connection with Neil, as I think Christy pointed out in terms of our teaching, was really against what in the early 2000s was a kind of intricacy, a geometric intricacy project that one associated with Scott, but also with Greg and others. And my interest in putting out an alternative, which was graphic expediency as opposed to geometric intricacy. And for me, Neil was the only one whose practice had already developed that sort of graphic expediency uh, in the work. In other words, against blobs, which tried to resist image, or icons which confirmed one image. You know, my argument was for the logo, and I think that that was also where Neil's work was. In other words, it's abstract, and it doesn't represent a current public or group, but it actually is calling a new one to come into being. So the, the issue of the architecture as a kind of graphic logo was part of the attachment, I think, to the work. And maybe finally is besides his pop cultural erudition is really Neil's uh, kind of knowledge of his predecessors and his willingness to put them to unlikely ends. Uh, so we had a conference a couple years ago, a few years ago at UIC, and I asked a bunch of architects, uh, we, we friends really, colleagues, uh, it was called, um, what was it called? It was called uh, Guilty, Guilty Pleasures, which was each person had to identify a project of between 65 and 85 
which was, let's say, an awkward period in architecture, uh, that they nonetheless loved secretly. Uh, not surprisingly, Sam Jacob picked uh, Charles Moore's Piazza d'Italia, for example. Uh, what was surprising and interesting was Neil's reading of Sterling's Flory Building as his example, and the way in which the kind of thinness and the red tile really become a kind of coat, as thin as a coat of paint or as a graphic. Uh, the way the building barely touches down on its concrete legs, like kind of archigram walking city, but in a way shrink wrapping Sterling's project almost the way that he shrink wraps his own projects. And so I could start to see the Sterling connection to like the Highline project retroactively, or you know that there's this um, you know sort of deep knowledge and being a fan of architecture as well as popular culture that is also a kind of affinity. Um, so the last thing is just the Godard quote that I think Neil embraces that I've used before, which is you know confront vague ideas with clear images, and I think that's what Neil's work does. So that's my love of Neil's work. Well, uh, he's also proud of this one. Yeah, yeah. He ha he already had that. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I think Bob's uh, Bob's let's say answer to the question of of what you know what. Why would I ask him to write about it? And his, his, him answering it um, maybe also doesn't completely identify the problems he might have with the projects as well. And I think that even though, uh, let's say, it's pretty clear that um, mine's not a project of, of difficult austerity and that it really is a uh, a project which wants to have architecture be fairly contaminated, even though the end product may be seen as being clean or, or precise or embodying everything. It's not a project of the unfinished. It's not a project of the rough. It's not a project of, of even in the end, you know, a, a, an obvious confrontational project. Um, at let's say in, in the way the generation above me might make it because if you reference Ito, Ito's, um, uh, you know, Japanese hospitality gets uh, sort of played out, but meanwhile it is very uh, uh, much a project that is trying to um, uh, redo or remake um, either typology or um, sensibility or, or what space is, you know, in, in and of itself. Uh, I think that to a certain extent, if you if you think about let's say the geometric uh, premises of the project, what would make it interesting is to find out how uh, and at what times do you think that the work doesn't um, reach the economy that I state you know that it does. Whether I use the word economy and you use the word easy cool, um, or I use. Uh, uh, efficiency in a way that, you know, with, with these moves, this happens, but it happens in a kind of manifold way, whereas obviously Scott is working constantly to get one thing to happen with every move. He can't get six things to happen because of the level of uh, consternation. I think that's what you're, you're saying, that there, it reaches a, a, maybe it reaches a, a, a point of little return, whereas I've always argued that um, whether it's economy or um, what did we say today, an algorithm or uh, a formula, a, a word that has to be explained to students because you know formulaic is the word that we use when there's nothing going on and something's empty. Uh, that it could it could have you know manifold effects to it, and I think that. Given that, it would be interesting to see maybe where where you thought that it wasn't really working, because I think in some ways it does. And and we were talking today about uh, productivity and speed with design and and uh, uh, issues of consistency and so forth. That I know now we're experiencing, you know, a bit of a stuttering world with all that because we have to produce so quickly and so forth. But uh, I think I think there I think. I want to say your 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 appreciation for the work wouldn't come without 
um, an undoing of it, an undressing of it in a, in a pretty provocative way. And maybe that's just I'm setting up the next part here. Which might mean why you uh, accelerated the book production so it couldn't go in. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you just work faster than I do. <laughs> You know, I also want to mention one, one related thing. Jeff, um, you might remember this, but Jeff wrote a letter for me for support for tenure at UCLA. And it was, great guy, deserves tenure, needs to write a lot more. And, you know, when I read that, whatever, five, six years ago, it was right at the beginning of taking on this project to the book. I, all I could think of was, does he think I have something to say? Apparently so. <laughs> and uh, I don't think you would issue that um, to an architect who you didn't think had something to say because not everyone should probably act on that at some level. So I think that um, you, did, you did, in a way, write something for the book. You made me write it, I have to say, single-handedly. <laughs> While Sylvia told me to write less, you at least told me to write a book. And uh, <laughs> um, you have always written the text for the book, and that's in the, I'm, I'm sort of being, uh, it, that's in the uh, acknowledgments. So in a way, you don't yes. have to do it. You're that's clear. Like, that's right. That's like, it's all finished. It's an invisible no poche. It's invisible writing. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're saying, what don't I like about the work? Is that really the question? <laughs> uh, no. I need another hour. No, um, I, I, I mean... If you ask for this, you're going to give us that. <laughs> um, well, I think, I, think that, um, I think that thinking about the work in terms of the end paradigm or the lower, right. lower case, yeah. not the uppercase trajectory, is the reason why I asked you to write about it because you would understand what's very particular about my project is that um, I per, I, I'm a purveyor at one level of shading and, and, and subtlety and not of hammer uh, wielding uh, polarizing uh, ideas. I know that. And it's not out of, it's not out of um, equivocation doesn't equal decision it's a bit like including more in the decision somehow, even though it's decided. And all I'm saying, I think, is somewhere in all of that nuance, you'd probably find weak links in the chain, I, I, I think, <laughs> if, if, so, if, if, you, if you probed all that way. So when you, when you enter a show with those other people that I put on the other side of the fence, it'll be okay. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I mean, I try to think about, like, what are the other practices that I would put in the same... I mean, I'd be curious to see if you have uh, reactions to the other people that might be around your work, which and I don't... Let's say, in a, in a broad vicinity, but on opposite sides, maybe, um, you know, Ben's, Ben von Berkel on the one hand, maybe and maybe Jürgen Meyer on the other and on the one hand one to me is too technically driven and the other one too sloppy <laughs> but there's a certain um, <laughs> Ben is technical and, uh, uh, too sloppy. well I mean I think it's not as precise in all the degrees that Neil's work is precise so it, it allows itself geometric expediency to it before you answer this question I, I want to you respond to the categorization of your work that he makes, which, is in, which I think is convincing. I had never thought of that before, but I, I don't think it's consistent with your presentation of your work and my understanding of your work. Like, it's I am. Um, he treats the thinness of the surface skin which I believe you use to investigate both the manifold nature of the shapes uh, as working between single surface and topological problems. And I refer that to your discussion of the, uh, not the 
container of projection with the other person. In other words, at one point you were you show a projection and you refer to a single world surface and the idea that there would be an artificial manifestation and then you wanted to do something other than the decay of the projection. Homolocene. Exactly. Yeah. The homolocene. And so I always discuss your work as being extremely early in the discussion of topological problems and surface problems. He used to recharacterize it entirely as graphic, as those two issues which he would associate with difficulty, not actually being topograph, topological, or surface issues, but in fact forms of graphics that are not representations of graphic design, but graphics and architecture. And I and actually I understand it, and it does, it's why your work has a certain distinction. You know, so I'm not saying I agree with him, but I think the, the characterization of the work makes some sense to me as a new approach to the work. But I don't think it's what you think about the work, or maybe it is. I think the graphic image of the work is an entirely different area, and in fact, it has to do with how you use graphics. But when, you, when I think of your shapes and your forms, I think of them as thoughtfully investigating topological and surface. Well, I would say, yeah, you're getting at something, and I think that if if the lower trajectory takes on an aformal project, maybe not an anti-formal, maybe it maybe it emerges as an aformal project that uh, confronting vague uh, images, vague, vague ideas, vague with ideas with clear images, or what I say, shrink wrapping. Uh, 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 you know, shrink wrapping phenomena that that can't be given form in a way. Using that term to sort of say, does it look like it does? Because we've just responded, you know, to all the phenomena that we put into the project, the brief, the site, uh, prevailing ideas, and uh, it's almost a magical isomorphic, you know, relationship to that which allows a, an obvious smuggling of a formal project into the lower mm -hmm. pathway, which I think is a little bit of what you're talking about. I would have to say that, that that's part of the ambiguity of, of why, it, why there might be discomfort down here, but that there's not a third category in the middle for somebody like me who, 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 who probably has secret yeah. Formalist and, desires, right. but don't play it out in a in a, in a world of uh, austerity. Let's right. say like Scott. And and there is, I mean, you know, the, as you saw the diagram, Sorry. there is the no, third no, trajectory, no. which is actually the Herzog Demeron hybridization in the middle. So by actually putting you at the end of that one, I think that, uh -huh. that uh, also uh -huh. overcomes that. <clears throat> well, uh, my, uh, last intervention, you were showing. Right angles and curves. All your right angles were angles, but all your curves were arcs from circles, no splines. Right. Okay. And so that was a kind of graphic trick. And by the way, all the handrails and all the window edges obey that particular formula, but not all of the not all of the surfaces. The surfaces use splines. And so I thought that was an interesting gimmick, an interesting graphic gimmick mm -hmm. to trick an audience, most of these people, I mean, <laughs> I mean in other words, that's, that, that's equivocating between the idea of graphics and the idea of topological or in vector, uh, because a spline doesn't belong to the logic of the arc, or, you know, the arc and the right angle belong to the same geometry. And they belong to graphics in a way, whereas the spline belongs to the top of the world and the surface in a very different way, and so it produces. But I do think when you can move the form itself, or the shape itself, to a level of vagueness, and I think vague is a very interesting word, so that it doesn't celebrate the degree to which it announces itself as totally determined by displaying its indexical, like, uh, ambitions. 
I think you're right. And I think that's what authorizes what I was reading. Mm -hmm. You don't say, oh, look, I can read every hexagon. So you get the uh, school of fish effect or the hybrid hexagon. But in your case, you don't. Know, it's just bad. Mm -hmm. you know, you, whether or not it comes out of a process of the is in the information or not, that isn't really important. It stands more as a lifestyle. This is a, it's a very interesting, and it traces also to that moment of how you're teaching people to read their work. It's not, again, it's not a gimmick or a lie, but it's kind of a gimmick line mm -hmm. and interesting things you can do. So, uh, I don't know, did that come up in any of your discussion about the fact that those are arts? And, no. Has anyone else heard a question about that before? No, not in. Not in particular. I mean, the geometry group today was, uh, you know, they were trying to. I think they were trying to get at the the, the formulaic, uh, shall we say? And and in in you know, in music terms, it's it's uh, uh, you know, it's three chords, and it all depends on sequence and how you strum it to make a pop song. And uh, in some respects. But it's also a little bit like um, partly having having invented a little bit those chords as opposed to just having them found in a way. And I think that's the ambiguous idea about what we can do, you know, with that geometry to to turn it into a, a project. And 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 using you know quarter circles and very specific forms of radial transition. Um, it's it's I've never thought about um, making that moment more complicated than what it needs to be and and have them be uh, generic in that sense you know then it's a question of where, where and how they You're work perfectly willing to go this line when you need to, to negotiate I, mean, I, I know I can negotiate with anybody and endeavor I can think of several places where you could never have solved the three-dimensional problem with a radio mm -hmm. so you don't need radio Mostly we do. Mostly, yeah. mostly we use just radial yeah, surfaces. All of those projects you did. There's no question. No, and in Endeavor there there are there are three D curves, but it's it's not that many. So my memory is exact. I have to remember exactly the three D curves. Yeah. That's right. So when you see something like uh, the slave announcement. Explicit moment where you bring in the slave house structure makes a very clear drawing where he has to combine radial geometries and uh, spline geometries to make a curvature of the structure. So he kind of announces he's abandoning his uh, total devotion ideologically to spline geometry. Not out of expediency, but out of need for both kinds of geometry to continue the architecture is going. It's in a certain sense a concession to you. I mean, it's a discussion. Mm -hmm. Because before anybody else, he was, he was the one who was teaching. His work teaches me to pay attention to those details. It's an art show. Mm -hmm. so, and are you aware? Is that something you would come to in conversation with, or are you watching? Somewhat, but I'd ask Bob how that would relate to the, or doesn't relate to the intricacy movement. Or well, I definitely think, I mean, I'm not going to answer for Bob, but little denotes to anybody, but a few people that pay attention, that that debate in Greg's capitulation to Bob, I mean, I think it's very clear that once Bob said difficulty had become institutionalized as its own purpose, and Greg starts the toy furniture and basically decides to introduce a role for the easy without abandoning the difficult, it was just a total acknowledgement of how white Bob was. And I think he said so that he wasn't particularly happy about it at the time. But I, you know, I think everybody that was on that side, if you're still doing difficult work, if you're still, you're, you're either gone back to Finland, or you're, 
for your second hand. Or I mean, you're you're so falling off the mark. If anybody wants to see it, I think that was an mm-hmm. incredible debate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> For Christie's version of the rock and sock and battle between theory and design, we had well, a like, we're still working on it. Mean, yeah, that was a like I had that happen in, yeah. in the lifetime of the students here. So it was a great thing. But it's but I mean the fact that Neil's signature project is the radial and the let's say the fillet, you know, the two dimensional uh, curve as opposed to the spline makes the no ma- even if the no mass house has some three dimensional curvature to project from one plane to another, um, it, uh, the project is there, as opposed to, you could say, the windows that end up in the Bloom House, which are theoretically three-dimensional things, then you realize how flat and they are. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But now we're talking about building something, and you were saying it didn't end because of an issue of... of uh, it capitulated to expediency. But construction touches the issue of the expedient, maybe not the cheap or, you know, the industrial, but something about, you know, material properties at some level. So do as an architect who's interested in building the work, do you think that not to get off track, but do you or don't you think that part of the moment it exhausted itself was that nobody could find a way to to realize it, or nobody was given the the uh, a, a legitimate chance. Are you asking me? I'm asking you. I personally think a lot of stuff is being built, and it was all disappointing. I mean, or let me say, what was not disappointing about it? Um, what was attracting attention about it? not satisfying to either the architect or the architectural community. Mm-hmm. People were paying attention to um, Frank's work for all the wrong reasons. Nobody understood his contextual qualities. So nobody when exotic or you know, ridiculous formal high chains was actually realized. Its qualities either didn't deliver or when it did deliver, it was not able to gain. It was so spectacular. It wasn't, and so I think that happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and then the alternatives of the reality came in, so I think the two combined at the same time. But I don't really. I mean, for example, that thing in Stuttgart, the, the Tuk system, you know, the great brain thing down in the middle. You mean in Milan? No, no, it's in. There's a Brisbane school, Frankfurt, isn't it? Frankfurt. 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 It's the shopping mall with a gigantic you know, tunnel down there. Oh, uh-huh. Stick. You know, like, for example, none of Wolf's work, some, some of which I think is okay, is appreciated in any sense whatsoever for its spatial considerations or anything like that. Like, I think they own this thing. But if you right. walk up and look at it, you just, you point. So, but 15 years from now, when people are tired of looking at it and getting into what's going on, then it'll work. But uh, it, won't, it, it, won't, it won't have lived it. It, it requires another sensibility. Mm-hmm. And that kind of work is not going to give that kind of chance. And other people are figuring out how to work in relationship to it. So, that's the issue of the question. But also, I mean, to go back to when Neil says shrink wrapping vague things, I mean, I think it, it can't be confused with what you could also imagine a parametric argument to be, which is simply here's a set of demands and here's the shape that falls around those sets of forces or requirements. I mean, it's not, it's actually the tolerance between some set of parameters and the shape that you get at the end. I mean, in other words, Neil designs a shape. It has some loose affiliation with the job, but it's also not like a Patrick version saying that we've just now completely, the form is a fallout of a set of forces and then that's it. You know, I mean, I think Neil's cultural obligation is to say, I've designed something like a product designer, which is to say that it also has desire and a certain, 
mean, that's the visual ergonomics part of it to me, which is that somehow it's not just a fallout of what's inside. It's actually a design, intentionally designed shape, which does not have specific references, but it also doesn't look like it's just a fallout of a set of parameters that produced it accidentally. Like the, the time capsule, right, which is the first mm -hmm. shrink-wrapped object in the book, which is a flipper. You know, it, it houses certain objects, but it's not totally exactly a fallout of those objects. It mm -hmm. is all, it's, it's a generic. It, yeah. It's on the level. Christy, you were going to ask a question. Um, I was just going to add that I think that Jeff asked me earlier why why I thought that you would have asked Bob as part of this as part of this discussion, and I think that. Um, some of the things that have come up are really relevant in terms of someone who, I mean, also because most of our audience is as students, and as a student, having, um, you know, Bob's theory seminar at the same time that I had Greg's intricacy seminar, and having studio with you, the this idea of how much therapy did that? <laughs> I'm still here working. I'm still working through it. Um, no, but this idea of um, smuggling, I think in terms of what we were doing in studio between these two conversations, I think was kind of really productive as a student. So it certainly didn't feel, um, so the work that maybe we were doing looked expedient as we were shrink wrapping shapes very much at that time and filleting things excruciatingly. With Neil. Uh, with Neil. Yeah, so it didn't, it may have looked expedient, but it certainly wasn't expedient in terms of our experience in studio and our detailed discussions about it, but it also wasn't explicitly like looking at Alexander McQueen dresses and thinking about how every piece could be different, right? So there was something really interesting about that in between, that feeling of like as a designer, we were kind of smuggling in some complexity and some, um, some of that while also producing a certain set of images that could uh, be part of another larger discussion. And it just, it brings up one thing that you once said about your, the Highline project, that one of the ambitions of your office was how to create, how to make something that would stand out and fit in at the same time. And I just wonder like how much that, um, I think that seems to be a little bit part of this kind of smuggling conversation. It's, it's a little bit shape, it's a little bit form, it's somehow um, in between that, it's part of the cultural project, it's part of the political project, mm -hmm. um, and that, yeah. So just, that's the thing that was, did you um, yeah, I'm actually going to chime in because Curtis is going to jump in and ask a much smarter question really soon. So, um, but just to, I think also my comment uh, and question with, uh, piggybacks nicely off of uh, Christy, which is, uh, I, and a lot of the a lot of the questions that I had have been kind of covered so far by the conversation. And uh, as Jeff pointed out, um, you know, maybe you uh, Neil's work is not. Um, following a um, institutionalized form of difficulty. Um, at the same time, as you prefer, uh, as you pursue buildings that stand out while fitting in, and um, as you've written, try to make uh, work that is uh, captivating um, to, to multiple audiences, it seems that you don't shy away from uh, virtuosity. And so I suppose um, while you may underplay the um, the difficulty of the sort of um, you know, chronic elements in your work, and you may try to, let's say, describe them very plainly as just three chords which are combined. You know, you're not the Ramones, right? And you're not Joe Satriani either. You're not Steve Vai, uh, but you're not afraid of doing an extended solo from, from now and again. And so I guess my question um, is, how do you reconcile that with your um, desire not to offend Bob here at the table on the one hand, and then also um, Bob, how do how does uh, Neil's let's say virtuosity sometimes push up against some of the categories that you've uh, uh, promoted through the years, like easy, relaxed, and cool? It seems like that virtuosity sits uncomfortably, uh, you know, next to those categories. I don't mind virtuosity as long as you don't show it off. <laughs> I, think, I think we should all have the virtuosos, just don't demonstrate it to me. Um, you know, but maybe, maybe my other af affinity to certain Dutch work suggests that I would not be, uh, you know, I mean, I, I also like sometimes sloppiness 
in my easiness, <laughs> as opposed to Neil, who's maybe the Mies version, not the Eames version, or you know, not the California case study version. You know, so there is a kind of high version of it, and then there's a kind of California version of it. And actually, Neil is oddly enough the European version, not the California <laughs> version. Uh, I, I, I would just say that. Um, uh, you know, th words like uh, virtuosity, which might have to do with talent, I've said maybe about certain Dutch architects that uh, ideology equals talent, uh, which going back to the Ramones is exactly the case, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Johnny didn't know how to play the guitar. They say, fuck solos here's all I need to do to make the project happen, and he goes out and does it, and then, you know, is a virtuoso in that mode, but didn't suddenly enroll in the Berkeley School of Music so that he could figure out how to play everything and then decide later, I'll just eliminate all of that stuff to do this, right? Mm -hmm. It's a funny thing, you know, in school we sort of want to teach you a lot about a lot of things that maybe you shouldn't ever use, or you might decide to edit them out, but we go ahead and teach it anyway, because, um, you know, you're, you're, you're asked that, let's, you have to do a thesis? Nah. Huh? No. no, okay, good. But, you know, that type of project asks you to eliminate certain tools and techniques, soloing capabilities, or whatever they may be, to be able to play something, you know, like this. and. I've always felt somehow connected to that because, quite honestly, I've always felt capable of almost doing anything. You know, just on 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 a on a on an architectural level. But what does that mean? That might mean to be able to speak the voices of other people quite well, uh, as opposed to puzzle out my own voice, which did come through certain conscious editing very early on of what I wouldn't, you know do and pursue in a way. So the issue of, of um, trying to um, make a project which would not completely eliminate the possible moment in which you would look at the work and feel something, whether it was awe or, or beauty or uh, otherness or something like that, um, I was always interested in finding ways to be able to let that through in the work. but but never interested ideologically in a project that would ever get close to the intricate or the difficult uh, in, in that regard. I just never had, I never had an, a, an intuitive or cultural connection to that project. And I don't think it was because it was something about pop culture like that would never communicate. It was never anything like that. I don't know if I can explain it so much. Um, but. There's a lot of deciding that was going on for a long, long time about the issue of virtuosity and talent and how would it be used or wielded or shaped or... or Because uh, I really feel like so much of what I do was, was autodidactic, enterprising stuff after school when I lived in New York and I just, you know, drew and made projects. That's really when I, I, I shaped the, you know, what I was doing. Well, I mean, I, I, you should take that, but but I think I think Christie. I mean, you could respond to Christie's quote in the introduction, which is it 
in acts audiences and doesn't serve them. Isn't that what you said about Bob? Right. It's about it's about creating it's about creating audiences as opposed to uh, capitulating to an audience. And so I, I also think this this conversation is super interesting because I think now the field is on board with the fact that the easy is maybe up on it's on the T. It's teed up potentially uh, in terms of conversation. That's but what I, I think, hate about the field. But I think twenty. <laughs> But I think 20 years ago, it, it wasn't, and you were pushing that conversation when that was very, when that was a very unpopular conversation, right? So there was this idea of sort of shifting the audience, not just sort of giving the audience what it wants, because I think that conversation was started, you know, 20 years ago when no one wanted to talk about the easy, and so I think it's a super interesting. Um, it's a little bit of both, I think. In, in, a, in a way, you started the conversation with, when it was untimely to create an audience, and now it's kind of come to fruition, and you're probably on to um, creating Yeah, well, a new look, audience. there's no doubt that we are now in a moment of... Hey, man, you can't escape answering Curtis's accusation by answering, responding to Christie's adulation. <laughs> so just for... So I'm going to, you can accept your adulation, but you must respond to the accusation of the damage you've done. Yes, and uh, Mirko Zardini just uh, a week ago wanted Sarah and I to come up to uh, the CCA more or less to talk about all the damage that happened since uh, Notes on the Doppler effect. So. And, and there would be like a tribunal, a kind of guilt tribunal of Mirko and the three of us saying, well, we were responsible, mea culpa. Um, uh, I'm not exactly sure of the question other than if it's a version of a Michael Hayes question of how does the easiness not become complicit with the status quo and capitalism and neoliberalism and everything else? Yes, is that basically That is exactly what it is. Yeah, we, well, we all are. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't know how you get. I, I haven't seen any evidence that somebody's escaped this uh, feedback loop that is the neoliberal political economy. But I certainly think that the specific, specificity of individualism that mass customization implies is for sure a neoliberal expression. <laughs> Uh, so at least I know that going that way uh, is confirmed to be the dominant political economic model. Um, but, you know, I think the, the thing about the easiness being, I, I think of all of these projects, and maybe it's my disgruntlement with the field, that cartoons are now easy, to, you know, like easily acceptable, whereas they wouldn't have been when Neil and I and maybe Mark Lee were on the other side as a loose popular front against the dominant ideology of UCLA as an institution, which was not, not I mean, I think Mark and Neil and I formed a kind of loose affiliation even if we didn't agree on every issue. Um, but, the, but the issue today is just that the literalism of this generation, which is to say, we used to have bigness as a project, now we just have big data. We used to have infrastructuralism as a project, courtesy of Stan, and now we just have fixing bridges. You know, I have no doubt that we had easiness as a project, and now we have just lazy work. In other words, I just think the, the moment we're in is basically taking the ideology and polemic out of a project and turning into its literal condition. So, you know, all of the projects have become bankrupt by a generation that just wants to do things and realize things in now. And so, you know, I'm at a loss as to what project hasn't been undermined by its refusal of ideology in favor of realization. I, I did a I did a talk. I don't know. It wasn't an accusation actually, because I think Chrissy's point uh, brings up the kind of concept, which is that in my opinion, you sort of defer its capitulation into the future by arguing that you're constructing an audience rather than an audience. Uh, and so I was, it seems to me that the work is defined by by constructing audiences. I agree. Um, but I'm curious as to how you would see, uh, let's say, the historical image of that as an active situation itself. Well. First of all, immediately after the Dollar effect, your colleague Sarah jumped ship, refused to associate herself with you any longer because 
uh, <laughs> and now she's at Dean and Rice. So. Yeah. Elaine, <laughs> and a good choice. Hang on. In your own house, all the photographs of the house try to make it perform near critical behavior. Taking pictures of ads to the slime where has the bus going. So you went to some ends to show that there was some longing for if some critical attraction, some way of distinguishing the merely, or as you just said, just just behave, just behave. So everyone is trying to figure out how to stay with the discipline and at the same time guide a project that's in the same fix. I think what's happened about it easy is instead of being one species in the ocean, which is what it was for a little while in a short period, it became not even a genre or an order. It's now a family and there's 5,000 species of these. And they're not even interested in each other. Like when what's your name did possible whatever it was, I can't even remember it. There were 55 species of these. Uh, you know, there was animal easy, shape easy. Well, the irony was they were all Greg Lynn educated under the difficult project. That's what really gets Yeah, because, we, because when you get educated under technique, we can do anything. You know? but I, so I, but I'm, I'm saying, I celebrate all that. I, I do think that. But I do think the question is, if you want to maintain a or the, the, the discussion is, if you want to maintain a political or is it a, a political or existential project or relationship to your work, you have to have an ambition other than resisting the institutionalization of a prior and you have to say something about enfranchisement, something about where, to what extent are you turning your direction towards a political or existential thing? Yeah, so for example, when you talk about product design and Neil's work in relationship with product design, and I, I'm, this is just going to sound like a professional practice question, but I'm not going to ask this question. If, if your work you know, does meet the standard that um, Bob claims it does, and it has no character, which has an index of force, it has no particular meaning, it has nothing other than a certain kind of graphic design. Then when it comes to value engineering out the cost, how do you protect it? Hmm. Like, in, like in the court competition. Well, I'll answer that specifically, but I think that I agree with the 5,000 species in the ocean now, not all of which um, are categorized as being part of the project to capitulate to capital. Yeah. Right? Maybe in the beginning you would equate the idea with a project that would be theoretically, you know, like the logo or immediately uh, accessible as being consumable. I don't equate consumption and accessibility in the same terminology. Um, in, in I, you know, in our sort of particular species of it, uh, and I gave a lecture at Rice called Immediate Grat Gratification where I was talking about literally, uh, uh, you know, trying to semiotically place and analyze the work in terms of, you know, sign form and where it was going to possibly become rhetorical or possibly remain in, you know, in a suspended vague or, or abstract state in a way, and I agree that there's probably realms of both in there because we do refer to industrial design where, you know, some projects that refer to biology, well, they, they have the tendency to be even more rhetorical and, 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 and have a lot of gravity in them in terms of what the, the forms are, but I think that... Um, that's what makes the conversation now more interesting. I don't think you can just, you know, do a cube now and go, well, that's um, that's automatically going to be consumed uh, the way it the way it was before. Or if I put a hole in it, then that'll make it either more indelible or more weird. Which one will it make? I mean, I think that from my point of view, the degree to which we're nuancing. Um, three chords or, or our own form of limited virtuosity, we'd like for it to be something, and I think the last part of your, your comments, Jeff, were 
well, you can't entirely operate off of resistance within, you know, your, you know, genre. So, yeah, what's the value that you have that, that actually creates a new audience or doesn't just serve automatically? And, you know, that's one, that's one big issue that we get, that we have to get when we, we deal with, when we, you know, we get a commission and we make a project. But value engineering out, I mean, what? Your, your design for the port of the port. Yeah. Yes. There are gestures in it that give it its um, character, but have no compelling functional, mm -hmm. symbolic, meaning, indicative performance. They're what he would call product design one. Yeah. And unless you are there with a the signature quality, you know, it's your master work, you're redeeming it without that gesture. Mm -hmm. History or this is an index, you're going to have to defend it, protect it, and those are going to require arguments, not talent. Not can't you see without it, it's hard. If you were just a user, you would do it in French. You know, there are various ways to do arguments, and he has one of some of the best. <laughs> but HL23 was a case where you showed the client. And he went with the more expensive version, right? He didn't have to frit the glass for any reason whatsoever, except a rhetorical aesthetic one. And the client said, "Okay, it looks better, right?" Yeah. You know, in the case of, I mean, you're, you don't know this, but the after the competition, we went through, you know, two years of developing the project. The client reduced the size of the overall project by thirty thousand square meters. Or? Yes. Just going to be three boxes. No, no, no. The current version now is already reduced. We, but they didn't. They didn't lower the budget. So they value engineered it for us by making a smaller project. I mean, that'll never happen again. I know in my life, but. Uh, but I mean, for, for example, now and also in the world of BIM, where everybody's seeing it in real time, and somebody saying, "Yeah, you're going to you say, one guy said, well, you remove this curve and say." $15,000 yeah. I need exactly $15,000 to fix this engineering problem. And, and the owner said, wow, that's fantastic. And there's a whole way to say, you know, I need three hours to explain to you why that's not a good idea. Well, I mean, everything is conspiring against the architecture in favor of the product design problem. That's what's worrying me. I, I don't disagree with we the agree. Yeah. theory. We agree. No, but the, the difference is, is the professional practice of architecture moving toward a model of product design by virtue of BIM and other platforms and the desire to limit liability and everything else? Yes. Uh, the issue, and therefore not being a service anymore, but producing products. Services fail, products are guaranteed to succeed. So that the problem of legalizing out failure, which is what BIM basically does by negotiating the point before you've actually designed it, on the other hand, learning from graphic design does not mean does not is not about the the trajectory of architecture toward design as a professional practice problem. It's a, in other words, it's not about um, I guess any more than saying learning from art would imply uh, an exhibition gallery project where each of us is going to do hundred billion dollar Jeff Koons projects. I, I thought that was what your argument against architects learning from art was. No, it was the effect of how I wanted to be registered in the world as more background than foreground. Yeah, I was wondering if we wanted, I mean, the students have kind of been with Neil for quite a bit of time and they're getting ready to be going with uh, Bob. So if anyone from the audience had questions. Going with, are we dating? Are we changing partners? <laughs> Tomorrow. Yeah. Swinging. Yeah, Neil needs a question from the back before he leaves. <laughs> Mike wants to know why you don't use more windows. <laughs> yeah. And Bob wants to know why I don't use more windows. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but you should get the, you should take
take the mic. What's his name? What's his name? That's Michael. Yeah. Uh, so I go with the mic. Mike. Pass so, the mic. Uh, uh, you mentioned this um, organization that I describing our text and practices in terms of ones that are have taken that or have believed this, this idea that form and ideology can't exist together any longer. Is, is that or, or, or that you have to basically pick one or form the other and that um, when you describe it, you describe form as being upper one and uh, ideology being lower. It's because a graphic I'll show you, that's just the way I play the graph out. But. Yeah. Okay, I, I was just wondering if there was an It's a beautiful drawing. Hey, thanks, form. These lines. Yeah. 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 My reading of Corbusier, which is that there's a there's one axis which is rationalism to empiricism, and there's another one which is abstraction to convention, and then mapping the project into the degree of which they are rational and abstract versus rational and conventional or empirical and conventional or empirical and abstract. You know, and so it sort of maps itself into that. So, but. Uh, but Jeff's right, there's no doubt an ideology to the way, I mean, I could have put the graph the other way around, of course, um, but, uh, but, but it's not so much, well, I mean, there's two things that will sound paradoxical, and maybe I will be able to figure it out by February, but one is, I think it's good that there was the split, and in fact that it gets split again in the case of Eisenman and Kuhlhaas, so it's not even just, it's not just that form and ideology are no longer adequate to one another, Peter's argument is form isn't adequate to form, and Rem's argument is ideology isn't adequate to ideology. So it splits again internally on the axes, let's say. The problem with people like Patrick, and I would even say Alejandro, is the desire to return to a moment when there is a presumed transparency between form and ideology. And so in a way, a re-inhabitation of the modern suturing of those things. They want to basically close it down again, and I would say that's the end of the discipline once you've made a one-to-one -one isomorphism or transparency between form and ideology. So, you know, I, I want them both to thrive as a species of debate. And, you know, I mean, the, an argument I made the other day at this new urbanist conference, whatever, was, you know, the, the beauty of 1977 was there were, there were, I don't think Jeff has heard this, there were, you know, we had different forms and we had different words and more or less there was a relationship between the forms and the words, you know, different ways. Today what we have, I think, is a convergence of forms and a convergence of words and there's no relationship between forms and words at all anymore. And, you know, that's, that's corporate practice. In other words, you don't know whether it's Studio Liebeskind or KPF, but everybody says, um, it's sustainable, equitable, and beautiful. Like, they're robotic step forwards, you know? And so that this is the problem. We've, we've limited discourse to be advertising and marketing, and we've limited form to be a certain kind of technical protocol, you know? And, and, and there's no relationship between the two, but everybody has to do those things and say those things. Everybody's getting work. What's that? Everybody's getting work. I love it. Because I don't want people to do things. That was my whole point. <laughs> Is there one more question? Ryan. <laughs> you, are, you are in the center. You're my guy. You were so thrilled with Francois. So one, I want to take a look at the Bible in your words to the God Son. I could do my friends while roast for you. Look deeply into the image. I'm hypnotizing you. <laughs> um, one thing I was wondering about is Neil was talking about uh, kind of the development of his project through uh, a reduction and kind of interest. So you say this is not what I'm going to do, this is not what I'm interested in. Uh, I guess kind of one thing I'm wondering is kind of us in school, yeah, we're going to have all those things thrown at us. And when really did you feel like you had a clear project that you were um, going to follow? Um, was it in school, after school, when you were like influenced by someone? 
still in therapy. I, I, that, huh? Yeah, I'm drawing on your own. I mean, I appreciate your question. I'm in, in some ways uncomfortable with it, but only, um, only because the uh, idea of some... It, there's not really a moment where you um, sense something in some specific palpable way uh, because it's whatever, 40, I'm 30, start at 58. I've been started architecture at 18. I've been doing it for 40 years, basically. And, uh, yeah. And uh, Doug Graff said I was young, though. That was today. <laughs> he said that. And, and uh, I said, if you're alive, you're young. Uh, so <laughs> I think we got it all covered. Um, what do I want to say? You know, school was a bizarre time because uh, uh, I had no... Um, I had nobody teaching me anything that seemed uh, reasonable or interesting. It just happened to be Much that like time. your situation. <laughs> and um, I worked with with just pure energy, sometimes with hubris, sometimes with with doubt. Who knew? Go to New York and you know get an apartment, and it was. Uh, it was a kind of classically driven moment. No, no light. I had a window to a brick wall two feet away. There were rats. I could just go on and on. And all I did was sit there and do that in a you know pathetic, super classical, kind of Garrett-like state while I went kind to work. Dickensian and, life. In New yeah, York yeah. absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, and I had to kind of go back to square one because I didn't really get taught something that was um, sustainable or a series of tools or anything like that. So it was like having, I felt like I had, uh, you know, a, a Ferrari in front of me. I drove it for a while, then I just put it aside and looked at it and didn't use it because I knew that there were skill sets in there. I had no clue. So I think it's part of the reason why I'm a teacher now is to be able to, uh, um, give students something that could be uh, useful as opposed to propagandistic, um, to not try to be a mentor, actually, in the end. I mean, I would say that Christie's, I uh, remember that class, and all I was trying to do was, um, you know, toss the cards up in the air again for that moment and talk about some possibilities that would, at some level, translate into a modality of working or thinking, rather than no, modality of thinking more than working, right? Because I think the last thing we want to do is give you some specific blueprint. And, and when, when people say about thesis, you'll be working on this project for 10 years, you know, if you're good and you focus on it. I said, if you're still doing what you did in school 10 years later, I'm probably not interested in what's going on. So... Uh, you know, it's a very evolutionary process. It's not a question that I get the question often. Like, when does when does whatever voice sort of tap you on the shoulder and go, now it's it's uh, unique? I think the more you worry about that, the less you'll find it. Do you remember when you started to do it? At least some time goes. Uh, the graphics on your drawings that suggested a kind of scientific precision and an interest in yeah. Well, not science fiction, but a yeah. suggestion of technical virtuosity in the graphics. Do you remember when that happened? Yeah, that was actually uh, that was actually while I was in GSD. I thought so. And do you know that when people when people ask you, for me, that suggested that you had a kind of virtuosity in those projects that I just couldn't discern. In other words, I thought the central for you. I thought. Somehow or another, I was supposed to be able to figure out why that was in there. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people took from that that they should be, not scientists, but they should have that level of knowledge and sophistication and virtuosity in their own work, in their own project. And that you cause people to desire to achieve that level. Is that your thing, Mr. Uh, 
technology to go on and continue. What was the effect you were trying to produce? And are you surprised that you were there? No, no. I think uh, when um, uh, this past August, when Sylvia had yeah, Elena and I yeah. talk about the relationship between art and 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 architecture, for me at that time the 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 built-in tendency was to try to um, produce an effect of absolute um, um, clinical accuracy and to do it with this. But at the very same time, I was looking at the work of German and Austrian action artists like Wolf Fostel, who, and, and Wolf, and scribblers. And while I could never get myself to scribble, there was also the tendency, and I think maybe this is where Wes and I were at a time on the same page with um, uh, a sloppiness that I wished you know, could get into the work. So at some level that never did, but the idea of expressionism, um, I thought the easiest thing for me to do is take the sort of graphic Clinis, clinical graphic quality of, of the dry and make it the expressionistic project in, in, in the work so that I would essentially fuse two maybe theoretically opposing agendas in terms of how you would make a drawing or express you know, yourself because... I mean, the reason I say that in the nature of drawing expression is because of that, because that's always been on my mind. If I took that thinking about your work Misunderstanding or fantasy I had about your work, and I understood how you were moving in relationship to the rest of the field. I mean, you were part of it, and a lover. I mean, you were never associated with people with a group, mm -hmm. like say, where it was or something. Mm -hmm. It was always easy for me to think I understood your next move as making perfect sense, as developing not scientism, but responding to what was going on with increased internal virtuosity and precision. So you were executing this project that you promised as you were responding increasingly with increasing intelligence to the developments of the field. So for me, there is never one of those. It's just always continuing evolution that makes sense with the desire to express from the drawing of the GHD. That's why I like that's, that's the best answer. <laughs> why I can't point to some <laughs> discovery <laughs> or... I'm already taught that to you. Stop <laughs> worrying <laughs> And I think, uh, I think we should stop while Jeff has the best answer. You guys aren't on chairs, you're on the, the big steps, and uh, we, have, um, we have a reception afterwards, so I think we're kind of a nice-sized group that if you have any questions or want to continue the conversation, I think we should do it um, not sitting on cold concrete. So thank you. And I want to... I, I just, I just want to say... Uh, thank you to Justin for his hard work and his whole thing. And <laughs>